Thank you for joining us for today's conversation on inflation. We are delighted to have with us today the master of all things inflation, Mike, the inflation guy, Ashton. For those who aren't familiar and fans of Mike already, uh, Mike is the managing principal of Enduring Investments. He founded the firm after a distinguished career with Bankers Trust, Barclays, and JP Morgan. Of course, we have our regular hosts, Mike Green, who is currently debating the future of money in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. And of course, Harley Bassman, AKA, AKA the convexity maven, who is also serving as the mayor of Toyland and trying to avoid the ire of Barnaby. So thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Um, this discussion is meant to be entertaining and is meant to be thought provoking, but it should not be taken as investment advice. So a couple of housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, we want lots of questions. We've already gotten a lot of your questions submitted and we'll, we'll try and answer them throughout the conversation, but please submit using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, not to chat, Q&A. So at the end, we're also gonna, we've got the, a survey. So please um, answer the survey at the end. Let us know, you know what you want us to talk about next time, what kind of guests you'd like us to have on and, uh, and we'll try and make that happen. So we're gonna first start off with a poll question. Eric, if you'd pop that up. So where will the December headline CPI come in? Above two and a half percent or below two and a half percent? And the panelists, you guys are not allowed to answer yet. <laughs> so let's give that a minute for everyone to submit. All right, Eric, will you show us the results? All right, a, a overwhelming 81% of you say that it will come in above two and a half percent. All right, so, so we're gonna go right into another question and then comment on both of these to begin with. So next question. If we see a CPI print above 3% in Q1 2022, does the Fed react in some way, for example, begin to taper? Yes or no? All right, Eric, will you show us those results? Ooh, even split. Wow. All right, gentlemen, take it away. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. I really appreciate you joining me and uh, my team. We got Harley and Michael here. This is what feels to me like a super topical discussion because we got a lot of things that are percolating through the investment universe. The single most important one is this question of what is transitory and are we going to see inflation? Have we changed the regime, et cetera? Now, I, I'm going to spoil things a little bit by saying that, you know, I've been very public and saying I think the underlying di dynamic and, and uh, conditions that we face on the long term are disinflationary and deflationary because of population dynamics. But I know Michael disagrees with that. And I know Harley has some thoughts on it as well. So he, here we are. I, I think the best thing to do here is to kind of launch this by starting out with a, a simple definition of what transitory actually means in, in this discussion. And so to, to head it off, my point would be that transitory means that we will see a rise in prices and more accurately, a rise in the inflation rate that will recede, return back towards kind of the baseline of one to 2% that we have been experiencing rather than a permanent increase. Harley, do you have any thoughts in a, in a different direction of what transitory means? I'm just curious when you think that time is. I mean, is, I, mean I think most people tend to think it's going to be December. So we've gotten through the COVID cycle, which was, you know, base effect down. And, and, and all we're seeing now is base effect up. Base effect meaning that we had negative inflation last year and we're back to where we were. So it reads as going up, but it really isn't just a return. So the question I have for you is, yes, it is transitory. But if you want to make your timeline 10 years, then we both agree. If you want to make it six months, then we disagree. I, I, I think that we have some momentum here and it's not going to be going back down, uh, especially depending upon government policy as far as you know, fiscal gas coming on in. But I mean, like I'm, I'm sitting right here in, uh, in the Hamptons and um, uh, I've been told by all these various vendors that they, they can't hire anybody. Uh, my, 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 I mean, these are fancy problems to have, but my gardener says he lost nine workers last year, he can't get them back. 
Um, this is good. This has to lead to higher wages, which is the key thing, by the way. Let's be clear. There has been inflation. I am so tired of saying there's been, there's been massive inflation, but it's been in assets, gold, oil, uh, real estate, stocks, bonds. It hasn't been in wages. Now you're going to see the wage inflation coming on in. And uh, so I, I, I say nay to your idea of transitory. Okay. Mike, I want to hear your thoughts here. Yeah, look, I mean, I think that um, it's interesting you mentioned wages because the Atlanta Fed uh, wage growth um, indicator came out a little bit earlier today. And the, uh, the one month, so they, they smoothed it on a three month basis, but the one month was the largest single month rise in the median uh, wage rate uh, since they started doing the survey at four and a half percent. So um, I think what you're seeing, uh, Harley, is you're already starting to see that pass through. Um, look, I, I think that that um, the, the problem, uh, one, one of the ways to define the transitory would be to say, if, if, you, if the underlying dynamic, if the underlying structures of the economy uh, don't adapt to, to an inflationary uh, environment, and so you know, somehow um, uh, or, you know, cause that to feed back on itself, then you know, if, if there isn't sort of a, a response um, from the economy, then you're in something that is is transitory in a sense. If businesses react and change the way they do business, change the way they change menus, change the way they pass through costs um, in such a way that that the dynamic going forward is different, then then to me that means that it wasn't transitory, it, even in the sense that the that the Fed means, even though they haven't stated it very well. Um, so for me, it's not just it's not just time, it's behavior. And I think that we're already seeing that behavior change. In, in what manner? You're saying that you're seeing a, an increase in the willingness to pass through price increases, or you're seeing a, yeah, a, a and, lack and, of willingness to restructure? Well, no, what you're seeing is, and um, so you know, I've got a bunch of you know, individual corporate clients, and, um, and typically what has happened over the last couple of decades is when they have cost pressures. Um, even if there's somewhat significant cost pressures, they try to absorb it in their margins, you know, with the, with the belief that those cost pressures would abate and eventually they'd recapture it in their margins. And so they would raise their prices just a little bit, but in, they would incompletely pass through. Um, and that works as long as costs, you know, ebb and flow. When but if you go back to the 80s and the 70s, the way that manufacturers tended to pass through things was fully, right? As soon as you saw a cost increase, you pass it through. And, and once you've done that, once you've said, look, we're going to defend our margins. If our costs go up, we're going to raise our prices. It's really hard to go back to the other way where you're, where you're taking, uh, where you're absorbing, you're, you're serving as a shock absorber to, to cost pressures. And, and I think we're already seeing that, that you, you hear it in the, in the quarterly earnings calls. So the question is, are, 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 are the inputs like lumber that went up and went down or are the inputs more like, well, I'd say wages, which are, which really never go down uh, and keep rising. So the, that's what they got to figure out is which, which style is it? Right. Well, and I think, that, so you've got things like uh, you know, wages is, is a great example. Actually, if you go back to the, at the early eighties, so I think we're, we're getting into also the, the, the part of the cycle, and by cycle, I'm kind of mean a really more of a super cycle, where, where labor is getting power back. Um, you know, labor has been powerless for a very long time. If you go back to the early 80s, you, know, you saw uh, you know, unionization rates that were huge, and, and that helped, you know, uh, you know, cause inflation to sort of feed back on itself. And, and I don't know if unionization is going to rise again, but certainly you're already sort of seeing that that power of the uh, of the workers. So there's that cost, and that's the one that I that everybody complains a lot about now. That wages are going up, doesn't look like there's any chance they're going to go down really soon. Um, uh, but there are other costs as well. I mean, I've got one customer who. Um, uh, buys polypropylene and polypropylene over a long period of time goes up, it goes down, goes up, goes down. Well, it hit a record last year and then it hit another record and it hit another record. And, and the company kept expecting it and everybody in the industry kept expecting it to go back down. And it just hasn't 
Um, and part of that is because of there's a the, the global shipping you know, issue with shipping so that that sources from Asia aren't as good competition. And so some of those things will eventually pass through. Polypropylene prices will eventually come back down, but will they come back down to the old level? I, I sincerely doubt that they will. So I tend to think that's right. And I would even highlight that lumber prices, which have retreated by, by and large, have not gone back down to the lows that were experienced, right? And so this is a fairly standard pattern where inflation responds to a shock like this, and it can happen in wages as well, right? They become sticky to the downside, and so you end up adjusting. But the other component of that is as the wages increase, you're also looking at you consume less of them. Right. So they are we're seeing clear evidence that, you know, there's lots of job openings without necessarily filling. Right. Theoretically, you could fill those jobs by offering much, much higher wages. And instead, we're beginning to see evidence that there's fairly significant business redesign, whether it is eliminating the in uh, uh, the in-store, quote unquote, service associated with quick service restaurants and fast food. Um, we're reducing the labor intensity of, of the economy, as you would expect, in response to a much higher price for labor, right? The, the, the other characteristic that I would just highlight, and I mean, if you go back to the 1970s, the vast majority of corporations were actually experiencing relatively depressed profit margins relative to history. So they didn't have the same flexibility in terms of passing through prices that they have today. And so, you know, in the immediate aftermath of the pandemic, um, in the immediate aftermath of the pandemic, you definitely saw that component. We can't absorb these cost increases. We're going to have to pass it through. But as we've re returned to record profitability in the corporate sector, in the aftermath, you know, the Kalecki equation basically drives it for us. But when you have this sort of huge government transfer dynamic, corporations are now operating on a very flush basis. And it's going to be interesting to see if it persists in that dynamic. I will tell you that on a personal basis, in just the last, just on this trip, I've seen my rental car price drop. I've seen my hotel room <laughs> prices drop, um, and you know I'm I'm already beginning to see fairly clear evidence that the higher prices are resulting in meaningfully reduced. Actually, my my airline prices as well dropped. Right, so on all three aspects of the travel, I'm now actually seeing not what I would describe as negative price pressures, but certainly a reduction in the extreme price pressures that we were seeing earlier in the summer as everybody tried to go back into a system that was operating off of reduced capacity. But did your cheaper plane flight actually take off on time though? It did, believe it or not. What you're seeing is a lot of planes are, are being delayed because of you know reduced- Labor load. shortages, absolutely. Yes. And so this is, I mean, I mean, that part of it, I completely agree with that the underlying character that you're describing where your gardener can't actually get workers is absolutely going to lead to an increase in the price of gardening, at least initially. But that increase in the price of gardening, perhaps not in um, you know, downtrodden areas like where Harley lives, but if you're looking at a situation where the price of gardening goes up, a lot more people will choose to cut their lawn themselves or replace it with a, a zero escape that doesn't require a gardener. So I, I, I think it's going to be interesting to see how not only we absorb the much higher costs in terms of labor, but we also redesign businesses so that they require less labor. Mike Green, is there a way, a place where you could hang your hat for why prices are going to go back down again? Because I think Mike Ash does a darn good story of why they're going to go up. Do you, do you have a story about to go down aside from you just think they will? Uh, I think that there's a couple of factors, right? One of which, and so maybe if we actually pull up some of the slides, let's uh, let me share the screen and I will go to the slide that uh, I referred to before. And I shared this earlier on Twitter. So this is a chart, obviously, that Harley, you're familiar with. You know, I've been using this for years. Uh, looks like Gerald Minak has picked it up. And the is underlying, his, what's that? It is his chart. Uh, well, he, he, yes, it's been used by others. But yeah, see, so the, the underlying dynamic <laughs> that, that exists here says it right is, there. Is, is that we have actually seen an incredibly positive correlation between what we're showing here is interest rates and labor force growth. What we're really actually isolating an even better fit is inflation relative to labor force growth. And 
the simple answer on a lot of this is people tend to think about labor force as a cost impact, but the single biggest impact of labor force growth is increase in demand, right? So when somebody enters the labor force, they need a car, they need a dishwasher, they need a suit so that they can go to work less so today. Um, that is a, a, a dynamic that pulls forward demand relative to the productivity enhancement associated with that. You can think about it in terms of keeping a capital labor ratio relatively constant. If you increase the quantity of labor, you have to increase the quantity of capital that creates an increase in demand. Given the incredibly low rates of labor force growth that we're facing, particularly with the accelerated retirement of the baby boomers, I, I struggle to see how this turns into a you know, significantly unusual experience, right? That it becomes persistent. Very different in the 1960s and 1970s, where that growth on, of the global labor force and broadly even in the 20th century, that growth of the global labor force and the increase in demand that was associated with it was radically different than what we've experienced in other periods and, and really quite different than what we're looking at today. This appears to me to be much more a supply driven story and therefore biases me towards the transitory dynamic. A glass half empty, glass half full. I see this chart as the core underpinning of why I think rates are going up because they ain't going up to 12, like I'll give you that, but up to three or four, as we've spoken about before, and will again, at that level, correlations flip. But the bigger idea here is not only is this going up, but let's think about you know, the, the, the detail of this. It's the boomers retiring who don't spend that much, being replaced by millennials who are forming households, have to buy cars, houses, washing machines, and everything else. And that's why you saw that huge peak in the 70s and 80s is the baby boomers, pig and the python, household formation years was right there. We're going right into the teeth of the household formation years for the millennials, which is about five to seven years older than my generation. And you put that with this rising labor force, I think that's what's gonna kick this whole thing up. And just for timing people, 2023 is when you see the inflection of, um, of boomers versus the millennials. So I, I think that's going to be interesting because I, I would argue that that's actually a big chunk of what we saw so far, right? So effectively, the rates of household formation exploded in the pandemic. We saw millennials rapidly move themselves out of the city. And a, a lot of attention has been paid to things like the Invitation Homes announcement from BlackRock earlier uh, this week that they have 8% uh, rental price growth. It's important to remember that that's suburban rental price growth. Right, so that, that, that doesn't incorporate the inner city dynamic. It doesn't incorporate the high levels of vacancies that you have in places like New York City, et cetera. We will see those recover, but those have fallen significantly. And as, an, as a uh, comment on the kind of the owner's equivalent rent, the dynamic of how we cycle that through is likely to lead to OER being depressed relative to what I think many people expect. Mike Ashton, do you have a comment on demographics here? Yeah, I don't see a correlation. I see, I see an interesting, a vague correlation of, you know, high and low. But if I, the wiggles don't correlate very well, and and you could put any number of charts here, like you know, unionization. If you put unionization rates, it looks just like the ten-year yield. And so I think this is spurious. Um, I think that, you know, if you, I can see that the growth of of work, the the workforce force growth rate combined with the productivity rate gives you, um, you know, the, your, your total growth rate, right? So I can, I can imagine that your workforce growth rate might be correlated to real interest rates in, in some way. Um, but at the end of the day, if you have, you know, uh, low real growth, because you have low workforce growth, um, then whether or not you have inflation comes down to whether or not you're adding a bunch of money. And, you know, if you're adding a bunch of money and, you know, if, if you're adding uh, M and Q stays low, then P has to go up. And which is, of course, what happened in the early 80s is we added lots and lots and lots of money. Um, so I, I don't see this. This to me is not terribly compelling. Um, you know, again, I don't see that there's much of a correlation there other than the general you have a high and then you have a low and those kind of more or less correspond in the roughly the downtrend. But I, I don't it doesn't. I think that if you actually go figure out an R squared that's on changes, not levels, I don't think you'll see much of an R squared. That's just intuition. I don't know. 
Yeah, having done that analysis and focused it on inflation as compared to um, interest rates, which is what you know is highlighted here, um, the R squared is actually quite high. Uh, it's in the neighborhood of 60, 70 percent. Um, the other issue that is interesting is the discussion around labor, right? And so we tend to take for granted the idea that an increase in labor costs translates to a sustainable increase in inflation. That's what's been missing. But the interesting data that we, we have on that, right, is, is, is that actually what's referred to as Granger causality, right, where you effectively decide which is driving which, which is the more likely cause, causality dynamic. Does inflation drive wages or does, do wages drive inflation? The evidence is actually remarkably clear that it's the reverse, that an increase in inflation results in a decrease in real purchasing power associated with the labor supply which then results in a reduction in the supplied labor and an increase in wages. Absolutely. Look, I 100% I agree there. I think that people, I think that, we, and we know that intuitively, right? If, if inflation, uh, if wages led inflation, we would all love inflation. We'd want to see a lot of it because we'd always be ahead of it. We know that we're always behind. I mean, just intuitively, anyone, you, you're, you're, you know that your wage growth always lags inflation. Um, and, uh, and so, no, I, I, I think that, like you say, if you go and calculate the Granger causality, it's sort of hard because it's so noisy, but it, it's, it's a slam dunk that inflation comes first. Having said that, if there, uh, there are, there's an exception that I would point out. And I, I think the exception is if you have wage increases that are um, uh instituted by government fiat, that is to say the minimum wage is just, you know, abruptly raised to $12, then, then you're going to get a feedback loop then from wages back into inflation, back into wages. But I, I, with that limited exception, which maybe not, might not be all that limited over the next couple of years, um, I totally agree that, wait, that inflation leads wages. Yeah, and I, I think that's right, by the way. I mean, anytime you have a structural revaluation in that way, I, I would completely agree that effectively that's an artificial restriction of labor. It causes a significant disruption, not unlike what we're experiencing right now. Um, if we took a different picture of inflation and actually tried to break it down, and so this goes to some of the points that, that Mike was raising, et cetera, on some of the larger components, right? So this is breaking down the consumer price index and looking at the components that have positively contributed and negatively contributed. Um, you know, Mike, you highlighted the idea of um, housing in particular, and I'd love for you to discuss that area in a little bit, because most people are not, you know, we've all become aware of the idea of owner's equivalent rent. But most people aren't steeped in the details in the same way you are. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that and then we can discuss this chart. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I, look, I think that um, people, people get all twisted up when, it, when they think about owner's equivalent rent. It makes some people very, very angry um, <laughs> that, um, you know, you see housing prices skyrocket and people say, you know, but rents only went up. And I saw this actually uh, I saw uh, this just today uh, about the CPI report that just came out, that people complaining that, you know, rents are only up to you know, two point whatever. And, and meanwhile, housing prices are skyrocketing. That's clearly wrong. Um, I think the BLS does a reasonable job of trying to separate out uh, for the homeowner the part of the home that is that is uh, uh, renting a place to live and part of it is uh, that's an asset price. And th it's, it's hard to disentangle those, that you, but you have to. That being said, the asset, the home is clearly a substitute, you know, living in, in, in an owned home is a substitute for uh, living in an apartment. And so those two things should move together. And in fact, we do find that when home prices move a lot, rents, uh, tend to go up with a lag. If you look at the FHA housing index, it's about a 12-month lag. If you look at the Schiller uh, home price index, it's about a 15-month lag. That that you know, when, when those when when home prices move up a lot, you tend to see rents move up, uh, not 
you know, quite as much, but you, you tend to see them move up a lot. Um, this is a really interesting chart that you have up here mm -hmm. because if you, if you take this chart back much further, what you see is that it used to be the case that rents and home prices moved almost in lockstep. I mean, for generations, they moved in, in lockstep. You know, the, the, the home price was a, a regular percentage of a, a regular multiple of the median wage. And that became totally decoupled in the early uh, in the early 2000s. And that first bump is clearly was clearly a bubble. Arguably, now we're kind of in a bubble as well. But what happened, and you can barely see it on the chart, is as you had this spike in home prices, you had an acceleration in sort of the uh, in in the, the owner's equivalent rent and the primary rents. And then as you had the crash, you had sort of this deceleration. So you can see that in just like these tiny inflections in the green line. Um, but going forward, what you see is you see this spike in prices we've had over the last couple of years that ordinarily would are, we would have already seen it in, in, uh, in primary rents. Um, the reason that we haven't is that in August of last year, September of last year, the CDC implemented a an eviction moratorium, which artificially sort of dampened those those indices, um, and so we've we've kind of screwed up we've screwed up the lag. But but at the end of the day, the problem is that either home prices have to come down a ton, or rents have to go up a ton, or both, um, or you've permanently changed the the uh, the relationship between buying a home a home as a place to live as opposed to an investment um, and, and an apartment as a place to live. I want to add something, so as much as I think that OER is a little bogus, that <laughs> this is really more of an interest rate effect than anything else. If I took the red line at 230 right now yeah. and took the mortgage rate up by 100 bips, all else equal, that interest would go down to 200 because yeah. nobody buys a house. They sign up for a 30 year payment plan and then you back <laughs> into how much house you can get. And so if you took rates from two and a half to three and a half, the median home price in theory, all else equal would drop from 365 to 220,000 and that index would go down to 200. So I think, I think this I think is right. accelerated by Fed policy of buying 40 you know, billion mortgages a month and making mortgage rates about 30 or 40 basis points below where they should be all else equal over history. Yeah, and what's interesting about that, though, is, and that's absolutely true. And by the way, it's also taxation, right? So, you know, the the uh, you know, your mortgage is tax deductible, and so when tax rates are very high, the home gets more attractive because you you know the mortgage is worth more um, as a as a tax shelter. But so, but it, but again, if you go back before two thousand, you know, you don't get these enormous deviations between these numbers. You get you get a much more regular relationship of of price to wage. Um, and it's it's you know it really is the last you know, 20 years where we've seen these crazy swings in home prices and maybe it's the institutionalization of it that you know, institutions now buy you know, portfolios of homes which they can do with very cheap fed money you know um, and no question that home prices and 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 mortgage rates should affect or mortgage rates should affect home prices um, it's just it's just really accentuated in the last 20 years and and so there's another dynamic that's happening here well, I, I think there's that. And then I also think that there's kind of the interesting question of how unique is the experience that we have in our data sets, right? So we, again, we always tend to normalize to what we experienced when we were younger or over the majority <laughs> of our, our career. And uh, I would just challenge people to ask the question, like, why do we actually think people are in, it's going to come out terribly, but why would we expect that people are entitled to buy homes? If I go back to the 14th century or 15th century or 16th century, you didn't get to own your home. You lived in almost all situations on, you know, uh, some local landlord's land and, and were forced to pay rent without the prospect of leaving uh, the property, right? How, 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 how is that seem all that different today? It does seem a little bit like we're moving back towards feudalism in a lot of ways, Mike. I, I have to 
<laughs> and so if, if that were the case, wouldn't you actually expect that the cost of ownership relative to the cost of rent, it effectively would become unobtainable but all, for all but a few? Yeah, look, I, I, no question, there could be something secular going on here. And, and I don't, you know, whereas back in the, in the early 2000s, you know, you could sort of you know, see with the, with the amount of this debt that, that banks had, and you could, you, could, you could see that there was a lot more, everyone was a lot more over their skis than it seems they are now. I don't really, I don't really understand what that fundamental dynamic is. You know, one of the things that Schiller has pointed out is that over an enormously long period of time, so we have data in, in the Netherlands going back to the you know, 1500s or something about home prices, you know, over an enormously long period of time, home prices tend to move uh, within, with, with the price level, that they, the real return on, on real estate is, is effectively zero, actually, I think, you know, slightly less than zero um, over time, hasn't been that way in the last 20 years. And 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 so why is that? Maybe this is as 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 you say. You know, maybe there is a a step change here, following which home price appreciation will go back to to the old way. It'll just be at a different multiple. I don't really know the answer to that, um, but uh, yeah, certainly the, the the way that people are experiencing uh, home buying conditions certainly uh, certainly is different than the way it used to be. No question. Yeah, I, I think this is going to be one of the really interesting questions. And, mm -hmm. and one of the comments that we just got in uh, was highlighting the idea that perhaps BlackRock will end up administering a nationalized council, you know, nationalized housing <laughs> council or, or program, right? And, it, you know, um, I, I tend to think that we often under consider these types of really fundamental changes that could influence it, right? I would highlight other factors, for example, the introduction of social security expansion in the late 1960s had the effect of limiting the need of older generations to exit their homes. Um, the introduction of things like property uh, tax abatements in California, the Prop 13 has created conditions in which nobody ever wants to sell their home, right? And NIMBYism has reduced the quantity of homes that are available. I think homes are one of these areas where more than anything else, we're actually seeing remarkably low levels of inventory that against an increase in demand, particularly the desire to get out of urban environments and move into rural environments or more accurately suburban environments in which there's more space, but there's also significantly lower proportion of rental housing versus owned housing, that those could be driving a lot of that behavior. And again, that's the BlackRock type dynamic, right? So invitation homes announcing that they have an 8% increase in the price of recent signings would be very consistent with a change in location. Yeah, oh, even even though you know, even broader than that, though there are you know apartment lists. Um, you know, there there are all kinds of different um, uh, rental indicators that that suggest that on you know on new contracts, uh, you know, asking rents are rising at a tremendous rate. Realized rents, which is what the BLS is really looking at is what's not growing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I have a chart that I probably should have put in the, in the book, but I didn't, but um, that, that, you know, showing the, that for many, many years, asking rents and, and realized rents grew at about the same pace until the third quarter of last year, when all of a sudden asking rents went straight up and realized rents went down and flat. And, uh, you know, because of the rental moratorium or the uh, eviction moratorium. And so, you know, the um, and by the way, so the eviction moratorium also has this weird quantitative, this strange BLS effect. And it, it's not a it's not wrong. It's just it's it it seems wrong um, in, in some way. So the, the, but the BLS says if somebody doesn't pay rent, they they ask the landlord or if a, if a particular unit isn't paying rent, you know, but there's someone living there. They ask the landlord, you know, what proportion of the rent they expect to get someday, and if the answer isn't 100 percent, then then that rental unit is depreciated by that amount. And so, when you can't evict anybody, you get a lot more zeros in there. And so, even if the median rent was rising a lot, the average rent, which is what shows up in in primary rents and and is then used in owner's equivalent rent, um, uh, just 
quantitatively stays lower. And that's the, that's the effect that I think is gonna change when the eviction moratorium eventually ends. You know, you'll, you'll see that, that when rental contracts turn over, they're gonna turn over these much higher values, um, either because people are evicted and they move to other uh, apartments and, and you know, land, or, or they just mark the landlords get, get pricing power back and they mark up the existing, you know, their existing tenants. Um, but one way or another, you're going to you're going to see those rental numbers go up a lot later this year and into next year. I think it's going to be interesting because I, I would actually pitch the other side of that, which is that the eviction moratorium has reduced the available supply. And so if I do need to form a new household, if I do need to rent, the quantity of homes that would be available to me are currently lower than they would be if we were to start the process of evictions. So I, I, it's it, it's going to be it's going to be interesting, but it, it doesn't lead to if I don't pay rent, by the way, it doesn't lead to a zero. Right. It actually becomes a question of well, what would the rent be? I'm not going to see any increase associated with that. And it will ultimately show up as a loss for the landlord against the depreciation of that. You will continue to see the depreciation dynamics. But I, I'm actually intrigued on this. I, my hypothesis and assumption is, is that some of the data that we're seeing in terms of the much higher levels of savings are actually tied to um, improper calculations of, of events like that, right? Um, if I don't pay my rent, am I actually not, am I actually saving or am I um, simply causing losses for somebody else who has not yet written off that debt that I'm incurring to them? Yeah, right. Is it a liability that I'm a, that becomes an asset for the other guy, or is it not, you know, zero for both? Right. And incidentally, I think what uh, what's going to be interesting once you're allowed to evict people is I I think you know some of what you're going to see is you're going to see you know if you remember back in 2009 when housing prices fell and people started talking about jingle mail, right? When you your the 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 home was worth less than the mortgage, and people would just leave their keys in the mailbox and and walk away. I think what will happen is even tenants who, you know, people are always are concerned about, oh, you know, you're going to evict all these poor indigent people and they're not going to have a place to live. And I don't think this is going to happen at all. I think what's going to happen is somebody who hasn't paid rent for six months is just going to leave and walk across the street and pay the higher rent that's over there. They just don't want to pay the back rent. And so you'll have the back rent that it ends up getting lost or, or replaced by the, the federal government. But, but you'll see those, you, you, you know, People will will rent very similar units, um, for the most part, except for the truly indigent, of course. But um, you know those savings will be used on another property rather than on their existing um, on their existing uh, uh, unit. I, I think that's going to I think that's going to be actually really interesting because I tend to agree with you that if I have not paid my rent for an extended period of time. We, we have we have one of the comments here in the chat coming in. Um, Kelly, I wish we could bring you on, but uh, um, it, it, I can't tell what part you're not kidding about, whether it's we, we have the comment, I haven't paid rent in a year. All that rent money went right into my Robinhood account in parentheses. Just kidding. So, uh, Kelly, if you can tell us what part you're kidding on, whether it's the entire thing or just the Robinhood component, that would actually be really welcome. Mike, Mike, uh, I, have, I, have, I have a question here. Oops, sure. I mean, Harley's still here. We, oh, she made the whole thing up, by the way. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I like the story. Um, we have 80% of the people here saying we're going to be above 2.5% yep. in December, which is kind of interesting because the tips break evens, which is bogus, of course, uh, are, are about that two, two and change level. What do we think? What, when the rubber meets the road here, what's going to happen? What should we be investing in and, and, and what will the Fed be doing? Well, as, as you know, Harley, we're limited in terms of how we can answer that question. <laughs> um, you can pick names, but you can, we, we can pick general indices. You can pick stocks, bonds, gold, commodities, you know, like that. You know. Well, let's let, let's let Mike answer, and then I'll come up with uh, some contrarian thoughts. That's uh, <laughs> About what to do or about what's going to happen? You, let's, let's do what's going to happen. Is, is the Fed going to go so, and actually do anything? So it, it's funny. I think that we got a 50-50 on that second question. Uh because it's a little weirdly worded. And I would go because it, it's, it, you know, the question is, you know, if we get about 3% in the first quarter of next year, will the Fed, you know, then taper or do something? And I think that some of the people who say no, like I would have, um, think that, well, they might taper this year because that's, you know, kind of a consensus, right? And so uh, what I think is going to happen is I think the, the Fed may sometime in the next couple of months um, 
start to taper. Um, I don't think it will last very long at all. And then, so the real question is, once you start to taper, do we think they'll finish tapering? And do you think you'll actually raise interest rates? And I think the answer to both of those is, is no, not going to happen. As soon as the Fed starts to taper, stocks go down, bonds go down. You have and, and what this Federal Reserve and the prior four or five Federal Reserves have all shown is that they cannot stomach lower asset prices. And so they will. And every QE, every taper has eventually led to a larger QE. And so that's what's going to happen is they'll, they may start to taper and then they're going to stop very, very quickly. And I don't think that we're going to get because asset prices will go down very quickly. Yes. So clearly people don't believe it's going to happen anytime soon because we're hitting all time lows and rates and all time highs in stocks. So no one's thinking what you're thinking yet. Well, or they think that or they think like I'm thinking, which is they think what I think. They think that the Fed, if the Fed does something, that they're going to quickly back off it. Okay. Right. So they'll, they'll, that, they'll, 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 they'll ring a bell at the top just to, look, to give us yeah, a yeah. bell. <laughs> that, yeah. Well, it's a good time to have uh, to 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 have, and I, I will say this without mentioning any particular products. But it's a good time to have convexity, particularly when it's very very cheap in this way. There are lots of ways you can get with long tail bad outcomes um, that are very cheap to protect against right now. And so, you know, um, you know, we wish we had a good way to do to have long get long tail. Uh, long upper tail outcomes in, in inflation, um, but there's no good way to do that. It, 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 OTC, there's no good way to do that, period. There is no way to good to buy convexity in, uh, in inflation at the moment. There is a way to do it in rates, though. There is a way to do it in rates. <laughs> you could do it in other assets. You could do it in commodities. You can do it in gold. <laughs> Um, which may or may not be a good idea, but you know, then, but uh, and you can you can even do it in a limited way in real estate, um, but but you can't do it in in inflation for all kinds of institutional reasons, which make me mad, and I won't talk about them. So okay. I'm I'm going to bring you guys back to the chart on the consumer goods uh, okay. component, right, and and the different dynamics on it. And one of the things that I would highlight here, and I'll, I'll introduce another chart to to discuss some of these dynamics, but there is a difference in inflation, obviously, between items that are what is referred to as hedonically adjusted and items that are not, right? And so hospital services, college tuition, college textbooks, et cetera, it's very hard to make a coherent argument that a college textbook, for example, has any mechanism of making this year's model preferable to last year's model other than the professor insisting that you use the latest version, right? Um, there, there's not a number of degrees of freedom in terms of improving hospital services as it's defined. You either have a bed or you do not. You either get a test or you do not. Um, and you, you have an appointment with a doctor. You're going to take a certain amount of the time of that doctor. It makes it very susceptible to what we were referring to earlier, which is you know, the underlying dynamic of the exposure to the doctor's time, which is a sticky wage that's unlikely to retreat. On the other side of the equation, we have things like TVs, which many people have made note of in terms of the declining prices of TVs and new cars, um, where the hedonic adjustments are quite significant. Computer software would be another one. I, I'd love to get, Mike, your reaction in particular to this discussion around hedonic adjustments? How do we sure. think about it? And do you think it's the right way to think about it? <laughs> you know, there are, there are a couple of questions that I'm guaranteed to always get. And hedonic adjustment is one of them. Because uh, again, it makes people really mad um, to, to, for some reason. So hedonic adjustment, it turns out, does not net add or subtract anything to the CPI overall, because while it decreases the the prices of those things uh, decreases the inflation rate for those things that you mentioned. It actually increases um, housing inflation because mm -hmm. the the uh, the uh, BLS adjusts the housing stock in the other direction because a, a home ages, and so and so it turns out not to net make any difference overall. But before um, before you move on, I just want to actually emphasize the mechanism there. So the the BLS is actually taking if your rent stays the same from year to year. By definition, the quality of that house has declined because it has gotten older. Correct. Right. So that's the adjustment that they're making in the opposite direction because yep. housing is so large, give or take 30 to 40% of the CPI basket. 
It's it a very offsets small, everything else. That's right. Yes. And it's, a, it's a small quality adjustment on a very large component. And these others are large quality adjustments on small components. What's interesting about some of those others and uh, cell phone services is sort of the fun one because, you know, um, uh, a couple of years ago, there was this massive decline and you can even see it on the chart. You can see this little dip in cell phone services all of a sudden in about 2017 or so. Um, and what happened was the BLS, you know, uh, uh, would always adjust uh, when you went from one gigabyte of data to two gigabytes mm -hmm. of data to three gigabytes. And then one day, everybody, uh, Verizon, everyone offered unlimited data. And it turns out that adjusting from three gigabytes to infinity um, is, is sort of a difficult thing to go quality adjust. What's infinity worth? Um, so, um, and it, you know, the BLS was very true to their method, but it led to a one month 7% decline in cell phone services prices, which, you know, was obvious. It was patent patently ridiculous and, and polluted core CPI for a year. But, um, you know, in general, I think that the, the and a lot was tie up the hedonic discussion with this. In general, I think that the, the, um, the purpose of hedonic adjustment makes sense. You know, we're, if you're trying to measure a constant standard of living, then you have to adjust for the fact that the standard of living of an average person does change over time and, you know, and, and certain goods uh, be, become better over time. That doesn't mean that my costs change, but the cost of a standard, a, a, a constant standard of living uh, was the same. The problem with hedonic adjustment is, you know, it's easy to quality adjust. It's not just hedonic adjustment, but quality adjustment. You know, it's easy to adjust when you change the size of your uh, of, of the the chocolate bar. It, it's hard to quality adjust something like medical care. You know, where the type of medical care or the or the outcomes associated with with a particular course of care change dramatically from year to year. And 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 frankly, you know, they're probably not hedonically adjusted. Um, very well at all. Um, so I, I think the, the, the concept is good. The execution is, it's at least, I think they're honest about it. I don't think it necessarily gets done super well, but it also, again, net, net, it doesn't really affect the CPI overall. I, I, I think that's a really important point. And um, uh, I, I completely agree with your analysis on it. It tends to be, as, as uh, others have pointed out, much ado about nothing. Harley, go ahead. I disagree completely. I think Adonis is total bogus. And, <laughs> and, and I mean, it, it was the whole thing was devised in the late 90s uh, as a way to adjust CPI down so they can the government could uh, lower the COLA uh, adjustments for, for, for uh, Social Security. I mean, you know, I mean, this idea that, that computers are better now because you have, you know, X gigabytes. Well, my old computer, I can't run anymore. You need a minimum X gigabytes to operate. And your cell phone needs a minimum of X gigabytes to operate. So you don't get, you don't get the opportunity to buy the, the older, lower quality item. Um, so look, it's a cook number, but whatever. I, I'm, I'm going to strongly push back against that because I can, I can go buy a fully functioning Chromebook now for 150 bucks. I can buy an Amazon Fire for 50 bucks um, that gives me <laughs> functionality that would dwarf that of almost anything that I could have bought two decades ago for you know $2,000. Um, so I, 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 I will take the other side of that, but this is one of these fun things where you, know, you, you ultimately can't really know. I do want to highlight this chart because this is to me, one of the really important things that we're broadly mm. missing in the discussion, which is, yes. yes, we are absolutely seeing a rise in commodity prices. Yes, we are absolutely seeing a rise in home prices, et cetera. But in general, real assets have been remarkably cheap relative to financial assets. And so there, there's an element of when we talk about um, asset inflation, we really haven't seen it in many of the real assets that we tend to think of as driving inflation mike and and, and michael there. yeah and and you know look i mean financial assets you know large cap stocks are supposed to be real assets right i mean they're supposed mm -hmm. to you know the they're, they're 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 supposed to grow as the economy grows so you know they're not particularly good hedges against inflation but you wouldn't think that this thing should only go down um you know, over time and even with this you know nice rally in commodities that we've had so far uh, they're not close to recouping, you know, a fraction yeah, we, of the 10 year decline. Exactly. We're nowhere close to even where we were at the GFC relative yeah. to anything else. So this has been a very tiny move 
yeah. in the greater scheme of things. So to me, that's one of the kind of important components. Um, Mike, roll to the next the other chart we have of, 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 of central bank money versus uh, stock prices. Well, before we do that, I want to show one, one more chart on this, right? And so this is actually a chart that um, our, our uh, boy wonder um, intern Shri put together for me. And it, it highlights the only reason I care about gold anymore, right? And so what we're looking at here is copper prices relative to the Chinese credit impulse. China is the largest purchaser of copper in the world. You would expect there to be a relationship. And the answer is no, there's none, right? But look what happens if we actually express copper in gold terms, right? And so part of the point that I would make about this, and again, this goes back to the dynamics of hedonic adjustments, et cetera, is when we take the monetary component out of it, when we remove the dollar and move mm -hmm. to a like for like dynamic, I would suggest that in many situations, we can use relationships like a copper gold ratio to give us an indication of the real economic activity that is underway. And the concern that I would just have here on the commodity side, this would be part of my pushback against some of the arguments that, are, that we've made is that while the US is important, it also appears that China is slowing down quite rapidly. And to the extent that China is not buying copper, to the extent that China is reducing its oil purchases, to the extent that China is reducing its iron ore purchases, then you're looking at a scenario where I think you could see meaningfully lower commodity prices in particular a year forward. Um, reaction here, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how others would think about this. You're saying low, cop, copper lower than gold. Well, and so this is actually the, the to, go, to go back to this chart, right? It's very similar. So ultimately, if you think about copper, right? So copper has a built-in hedonic adjustment associated with it. Nobody actually cares about how many pounds of copper you buy. You buy copper for its functionality. How many electrons can it deliver over, mm -hmm. over a cable, right? Mm -hmm. how, many, um, how many pots can you produce with various uh, copper coating to facilitate the transfer of heat effectively, right? You care about the... Uh, the innovation component on it. Gold doesn't have that, right? And so the way I describe it to Shri is, is that there's two dimensions to copper. How much does it cost to get it out of the ground? And how much do I need to fulfill my application? And I can innovate on both sides. Gold, I can only innovate on how much it costs me to get out of the ground. Because at the end of the day, a gram of copper or an ounce of, or an ounce of gold is what I'm ultimately measuring against, right? So the deflationary characteristics that we saw throughout the 18th and 19th centuries as we were on the gold standard, I would actually argue does a better job of giving us some indications of that productivity. And if people put prices to go back to this chart and they look at many of the industrial commodities relative to gold, I would actually suggest that some of them have gotten relatively expensive, right? So the, the, the price of oil in gold terms has returned to relative peaks. The price of copper has risen um, to the upper end of its downtrend channel, et cetera. So th this is one of the things I'm watching very closely. Um, to the question of tips, I think this is what, is, is this what you were looking for? Or is this what you're that looking for? Yeah. This one. Okay. Go ahead. Answer your question. I was, I was just going to go and comment here that, you know, we, we've seen massive inflation and it's linked basically to money being printed. And as the money is printed, it goes into financial assets so far, it goes into this woman's Robinhood account, where she probably bought Robinhood on the IPO, and she's done very well. <laughs> um, that's like a uh, jumbo shrimp. In any case, um, so, but what I, I'll tell you what I think over here, just to answer my own question from before, is that I, I, I don't think the Fed does anything early on, because I think they want to run the market hot, as they said they would, um, and they could run that for quite a while. I think the money printing continues. And I think, therefore, the what you want. This line keeps going up. I think you want to own. I think you want to own equities. I think equities are very uh, broad equities. Uh, they do well in inflation early on uh, because you do own a claim on a real asset. It may not be a house or a bar of gold, but it is a, a, a continuing business that is that is real. Uh, and so inflation helps yeah. that. I think bonds are are, are, are lousy. And right. as far as commodities and gold, I have no idea. But I will say that if you look at various look at various things out there in the world um you can get some pretty interesting value right now uh, i can get exposure to these things and i i'm I, these are indices but if you look at like the european stock market you can buy a three and a half year option 
this is not good at all, is it? Uh, <laughs> If you have to take that, Harley, I can. Uh, yeah, no, we, we, we can cover for you. <laughs> we can wait. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, you could buy a three and a half year option on the SX5V at the money for 8%. You can go and do out to January 2023 on the S&P. You could buy a, um, a 10% out of the money call and sell a 22 and a half percent out of the money put for zero cost. These are great ways to go and get uh, exposure to what I think is going to be inflation uh, early on and the Fed lag, lagging behind it. I do want to push back a little bit on the, um, on the equity thing, because it, it, although it's true early in inflation, sometimes you get the, you know, the positive equity re, um, uh, response when you actually move to, to a different inflation regime. So if this is just a one-time you know, thing, whatever, but if, if we move from a, a regime where inflation goes from one to 2%, instead it's at three to 4%, then, then historically what happens is the multiples of the uh, attached to those cash flows go, goes down a lot. Um, Medigliani, not initially, not initially, not initially yes. but, but once you get, once you've made that transition to, you know, think once inflation expectations get up to that level, you know, Medigliani pointed, you know, said in the early eighties that this was a, an absolute error. There's no way these are real assets and they shouldn't be discounted any differently when inflation goes up. And everyone said, yes, yes, Franco, but it happens. And, and it, you know, historically, as V. Bodhi always points this out, and actually it was V. Bodhi wrote a paper in 73 pointing out that, that um, for large changes in inflation, uh, equities are, are inversely correlated because of the valuation, not because of the earnings. If you have a private, if you're a private owner, Right. If you own a, if you're if you're a, you know, own private equity, if you if you're a private owner of a business, then you then you do fine because your earnings go up with inflation. If you have to price that, and so you're an indirect owner that owns a public security on the business, that's where you get screwed in with the inflation, not because of the earnings, but because of the multiple. I, I, and, and to me, it's just a question of degrees, right? So I agree with Mike that when there is a significant change in um, the rate of inflation or the regime of inflation that's likely to lead to an increase in the discount rate and a lower multiple, whether that flows through on the earnings side or not more rapidly than um, on the valuation side is, is somewhat tied to the individual security. But broadly speaking, I, I agree with Mike, like if we were actually seeing inflationary conditions and people piling into stocks because of a fear of inflation, what we should expect to see is actually reduce multiples even as prices rise. And we're really not seeing that. We're not seeing a lot of evidence for it. We have one question that I want to make sure that we hit on because it's something that we talk about all the time. And I'm going to let Harley handle this, which is the question of why are tips so messed up as a measure of inflation, <laughs> right? And so if, if, if I flip to, I'm going to uh, share my screen here quickly. And hopefully this comes through properly. Uh, as, while you're doing that, I will just preview by saying I've written about this before. I hate I I I hate tips because I hate CPI because I think CPI is a bogus number. Uh, now that's out of the way. Um, the government here has been is now uh, they've taken their purchase of tips uh, started about a year ago from owning 10% of the outstanding issuable tips to owning 25%. They did this over the course of uh, about six months, and now they are actually buying more tips than are being created. Um, if you look at the net issuance of them, they're buying more than being created. And, and, and the problem with this is, is, aside from the fact that tips are the wrong price, ignoring that small detail, is that what is the real purpose of tips? Why did we actually make tips, the government? They did it so we can get the Fed and policymakers can get information, feedback on what does the world think inflation is going to be. Best way to get information from someone is to make them put money down. And we've now lost that because the yep. Fed has disrupted this product area. And I, I think it's a, a massive public policy mistake um, because knowing where inflation is going to be, where the market thinks inflation is going to be two years, five years, 10 years from now is very important. And, and as we just saw from this poll over here, I think we were both shocked. All, all three of us were shocked by the uh, answers we got. I, I, I would actually emphasize what Harley's hitting on and extend that more broadly, right? So this is, to me, one of the most pernicious effects that's going on out there. It's just, it's simultaneously, we're trying to treat things as information, and then we're also trying to use um, that level to guide the public, the, the public in terms of their expectations as well, right? So the Fed sees a risk-off event, 
accelerates its purchasing of tips, right? With the objective of saying, okay, we're going to keep interest rates low. That in turn, of course, then destroys the signal or the information content. And this differential combined with the fact that most target date funds are now in an accelerated tip purchasing mode, right? So we're seeing it not just from the Fed, but also from the systematic uh, retirement vehicles. To me, that's really what's driving the negative real rates that are being printed, right? Excess demand for tips over nominals is going to drive real rates negative. Look, if you if the Fed is going to if they're going to fix the ten year nominal rate at two percent, and inflation expectations go up. The only way for that to happen is for tips yields to go way, 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 way negative. And if the Fed is is buying most of the float and institutional investors are buying most of the rest of the float, it means that when there's a small change, it, there does not have to be a big change in the public's buying uh, preferences for tips for you to get really crazy low real yields because there's just nothing to buy. Look, this is one of the reasons that I, um, you know, there, there should be uh, inflation futures. Um, you know, uh, inflation swaps do exist and they don't, you know, they are independent of, of uh, you know, you still, you still trade CPI, but, but the Fed buying all the tips just makes them harder to hedge. It doesn't actually, you know, it has nothing to do with the actual transaction. So, you know, there should be other instruments that allow us to trade these in a more liquid way. I will say that if you, you know, Harley, if you don't like tips because you don't like CPI, then you know it just means that you should have a different a different price right so the yield should be higher if you're getting a bad inflation uh, index if you look in um uh at uh you know argentina where they kind of made up the inflation numbers um that the bonds are tied to you, what you saw was that real yields were dramatically higher because everyone know, knew that they made up we have one figure. more question the time clock's running out here let's just assume that inflation goes to three percent uh, and there it is, Nick, all next year. Will we see bond rates go up also or not? Mike and Mike. My expectation is, is that you will see, a, it, under that scenario, you will see a modest increase in rates. You'll see tens move back towards the 175.2 level that, uh, that we peaked at. And in my view, this is not dissimilar to the experience that we had from 2016 to 2018. Yeah, and that I, I would agree. I think that you'll get a mild backup, but I, I do think that that um, the idea that the Fed is just going to let interest rates go to their natural level. Look, normally when we have two and a half percent inflation, nominal rates are in the fours, right, or fives. So the you know if if the Fed were to let let rates go to their natural level, they would be it would it would come unglued. That's not going to happen, and therefore, what's probably going to happen if inflation rises is you're going to see tips yields go lower and lower. Um, even as you see, they tend to move. The yields tend to move. Real yields tend to move with nominal yields, but you might actually see them come decoupled. Real yields go down. Nominal yields go up. Yeah, I, I think there's possibility of that as well. Um, I, I'd want to hit on one last point. I know Brian's eager to get us off the air because um, nobody really wants to listen to us for more than an hour. But we have an event coming up that um, I feel we'd be remiss if we didn't share or pontificate on kind of our view of, of what's going to happen with the uh, debt ceiling approaching. And so I, I just want to do a quick tour of the panel in terms of what's your expectation around the debt ceiling dynamics? Meaningless. They're going to pass it. Of course. Yeah, I mean, it, there'll be a lot of sturm und drang, and at the end of the day, it'll all get passed. But uh, you know, we are talking many, <laughs> we are talking a much larger uh, piercing of the debt ceiling, and it, and we're going to get into dangerous that the, the, the treasury will use up their slack a lot faster than they have in the past because we're burning through it so fast. So we might see the the uh, the negotiations happen more quickly. But of course, they'll they'll reach you know they'll they'll figure out a way to raise the debt ceiling because the worst thing that could happen to Congress is not being able to borrow and spend. Well, in closing, I'll say this, that you should look at, uh, at, at products out there that are long convexity Absolutely. because optional, option prices are way too low relative to the uncertainty in front of us. 100% agree. Yeah, I, I think that's I, I think that's right. I think the panel is unanimous on this, that we will see Sturm and Drang and lots of political posturing. But at the end of the day, we're going to end up seeing them choose to the path of least resistance, which is to spend more money. Um, <laughs> it, it, it does it does feel like um, the panel has basically come back to the place 
that says we have some disagreement about the dynamics of the transitory components, right? Or how long this will last. But the majority of what I think we're saying, and Mike, you could disagree here. I think, I think Harley may as well, but it, it does feel like we're saying we're not expecting a hyperinflationary or an accelerating inflationary environment anytime soon. Does that feel reasonable? I, I would say certainly hyperinflationary, no, because to do that, you have to lose confidence in the currency and that I don't see that happening anytime really no. soon. Accelerating inflation, um, before this all happened, I, I, I sort of was expecting higher highs and higher lows out of inflation. And I think that'll still be the case for the next generation or so, uh, except that we're setting a really high high. And so I don't know that with the, the zigzag might have changed a little bit from what I thought it was going to happen. But um, no, I, I think that we are now in a secular uptrend in inflation for some time. Nay to hyperinflation. Um, rates ain't going to 8%, but they can go to 3 4%. Uh, and if they get there, you'll have very bad consequences. Yeah. Please go to our website to go look at uh, that discussion of correlations. Nice work, Harley. Mike, it was a real pleasure having you on board. It's been a pleasure getting to talk with both of you on this subject. <laughs> and we're going to pass it back off to Brian to wrap it up. Well, I'm glad we got we actually got some disagreements there at the end. because uh, <laughs> You guys were getting along way too well for the first half of it. <laughs> And Harley, Harley, extra points for for having a landline still. That's that's impressive, Mike. Uh, bonus points for the use of nimbyism. And uh, Mike Ashton, you did a great job of tactfully plugging our strategies. And as Mike said, uh, <laughs> visit us at simplify.us for more information. This was an awesome discussion, Mike Ashton. Thank you so much for joining us, um, audience. Thank you for your time and your wonderful questions. Please help us by getting by providing some feedback to us to help you guys, you know, us give you guys um, more content. So fill out the survey and um, tell us what you want, to, want us to talk about, who you'd like us to have on, and then we'll see you again next month on September 9th at 4.30 Eastern Standard Time. Have a great afternoon.